Chapter 11 of Leonora by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 11 The Refusal. Fifteen months after John's death, and the inquest on his body, and the clandestine funeral, Leonora sat alone one evening in the garden of the house at Hillport. She wore a black dress trimmed with jet, a narrow band of white muslin clasped her neck, and from her shoulders hung a long, thin, antique gold chain, once the ornament of Aunt Hannah. Her head was uncovered, and the mild breeze which stirred the new leaves of the poplars moved also the stray locks of her hair. Her calm and mature beauty was unchanged. It was a common remark in the town that during the past year she had looked handsomer than ever, more content, radiant, and serene. And it's not surprising either, people added. The homestead appeared to be as of old. Carpenter was feeding Prince in the stable. Bran lay huge and benign at the feet of his mistress. The borders of the lawn were vivid with bloom. And within the house Bessie still ruled the kitchen. No luxury was abated and no custom altered. Time apparently had nothing to show there, save an engagement ring on Bessie's finger. Many things, however, had occurred, but they had seemed to occur so placidly, and the days had been so even, that the term of her widowhood was to Leonora more like three months than fifteen, and she often reminded herself, it was last spring, not this, that he died. The business is right enough, Fred Riley had said positively, with an emphasis on the word business, when he met Leonora and Uncle Meshack in family council during the first week of the disaster and Meshach had replied, "'Thou shalt prove it, lad.' The next morning Mr. Mayer, the manager, and everybody on the bank, learned that Fred, with old Myatt at his back, was in sole control of the works at Shawport. Creditors breathed with relief, and the whole of Bursley remembered that it had always prophesied that Fred's sterling qualities were bound to succeed. Meshach lent several thousands of pounds to Fred at five per cent, and Fred was to pay half the net profits of the business to Leonora as long as she lived. The youth did not change his lodgings, nor his tailor, nor his modest manners, but he became nevertheless suddenly important, and none appreciated this fact better than Mr. Mayer, whose sandy hair was getting grey, and who, having six children but no rich great-uncle, could never hope to earn more than three pounds a week. Fred was now an official member of the Myatt clan and in the town men of position, pompous individuals who used to ignore him, greeted the sole principle of Twemlow and Stanways with a certain cordiality. After an interval his engagement to Ethel was announced. Every evening he came up to Hillport. The couple were ardently and openly in love. They expected always to have the dining-room at their private disposal, and they had it. Ethel simply adored him and he was immeasurably proud of her. Even in presence of the family they would sit hand in hand, making no attempt to conceal their bliss. For the rest, Fred's attitude to Leonora was very affectionate and deferential. It touched her, though she knew he worshipped her ignorantly. Rose and Millicent wondered what Ethel could see in him. He was neither amusing, nor smart, nor clever, nor even vivacious. He had little acquaintance with games, music, novels, or the feminist movement. He was indeed rather dull. But they liked him, because he was fundamentally and invariably nice. At the close of the year of Stanway's death, Fred had paid to Leonora four hundred and fifty pounds as her share of the profits of the firm for nine months. But long before that Leonora was rich. Uncle Meshach had died, and left her the Myatt fortune for life, with remainder to the three girls absolutely in equal shares. Fred was the executor and trustee, and Fred's own share of the bounty was a total remission of Meshach's loan to him. Thus it is that Providence watches over the wealthy, the luxurious, and the well-connected, and over the lilies of the field who toil not. Aroused from lethargy by the dramatic circumstances of her father's death, Rose had resumed her reading with a vigour that amounted almost to fury. In the following January she miraculously passed the matriculation examination of London University in the first division, and on returning home she informed Leonora 
that she decided to go back to London and study medicine at a hospital for women. But of the three girls, it was Millicent who had made the most history. Millicent was rapidly developing the natural gift, so precious to the theatrical artist, of existing picturesquely in the eye of the public. When the rehearsals of Princess Ida began for the annual performance of the Operatic Society, Millie confidently expected to receive the principal part, despite the fact that Lucy Turner, who had the prescriptive right to it, was once more in a position to sing. And Millie was not disappointed. As a heroine of comic opera, she now counted herself an extremely serious person, and it soon became apparent that the conductor and his prima donna would have to decide between them who was to control the rehearsals while Millie was on the stage. One evening, a difference of opinion as to the temper of a song and chorus reached the condition of being acute. Exasperated by the pretty and wayward child, the conductor laid down his stick and lighted a cigarette, and those who knew him knew that the rehearsal would not proceed until the duel had been fought to a finish. Milly thought hard and said, Mr. Corfe says the Hambridge people would jump at me. My good girl, the conductor replied, Mr. Corfe's views on the acrobatic propensities of the Hambridge people are just a shade off the point. Everyone laughed except Milly. She possessed little appreciation of wit, and she had scarcely understood the remark. But she had an objection to the laughter, and a very strong objection to being the conductor's good girl. The instant result was that she vowed never again to sing or act under his baton, and took the entire society to witness. Her place was filled by Lucy Turner. The Hambridge Society happened to be doing patience that year, and they justified Mr. Corfe's prediction. Moreover, they hired the Hambridge Theatre Royal for six nights. On the first night, Milly was enthusiastically applauded by two thousand people, and in addition to half a column of praise in the signal, she had the happiness of being mentioned in the district news of the Manchester Guardian and the Birmingham Daily Post. She deemed it magnificent for her. Leonora tried to think so, too. But on the fourth day the Hambridge conductor was in bed with influenza, and the Burster conductor, upon a flattering request, undertook his work for the remaining nights. Milly broke her vow. Her practical common sense was really wonderful. On the last and most glorious night of the six, after responding to several frenzied calls, Milly was inspired to seize the conductor in the wings and drag him with her before the curtain. The effect was tremendous. The conductor had won, but he very willingly admitted that, in losing, the adorable chit had triumphed over him. The episode was gossip for many days. And this was by no means the end of the matter. The agent in advance of one of the touring musical comedy companies of Lionel Belmont, the famous Anglo-American manager, was in Hanbridge during that week, and after seeing Milly in the piece, he telegraphed to Liverpool where his company was, and the next day the manager visited Hanbridge incognito. Then Harry Burgess began to play a part in Millicent's history. Harry had abandoned his stool at the bank, expressing his intention to undertake some large commercial enterprise. He persuaded his mother to find the capital. The leisurely search for a large commercial enterprise precisely suited to Harry's tastes necessitated frequent sojourns in London. Harry became a man about town, and a member of the renowned New Fantastics Club. The New Fantastics were powerful supporters of the dramatic art, and the role of the club included numerous theatrical stars of magnitudes varying from the first to the tenth. It was during one of the club's official excursions, in pantechnicum vans, to a suburban theatre where a good French actress was performing, that Harry made the acquaintance of that important man, Louis Louis, Belmont's head representative in Europe. Louis Louis, over champagne, asked Harry if he knew a Millicent Stanway of Bursley. The effect of the conversation was that Harry came home and astounded Milly by telling her what Louis Louis had authorised him to say. There were conferences between Leonora and Milly and Mr. Cecil Corf, a journey to Manchester, hesitations, excitations, thrills, and in the end, an arrangement. Milly was to go to London to be finally appraised, and probably to sign a contract for a sixteen weeks provincial tour at three pounds a week. 
Leonora's prevailing mood was the serenity of high resolve and of resignation. She had renounced the chance of ecstasy. She was sad, but she was not unhappy. The melancholy which filled the secret places of her soul was sweet and radiant, and she had proved the ancient truth that he who gives up all finds all. Still in rich possession of beauty and health, she nevertheless looked forward to nothing but old age, an old age of solitude and suffering. Hannah and Meshach were gone. John was gone. And she alone seemed to be left of the elder generations. In four days Ethel was to be married. Already for more than three months Rose had been in London, and in a fortnight Leonora was to take Millicent there. And when Ethel was married, and perhaps a mother, and Rose versed and absorbed in the art and craft of obstetrics, and the name of Millicent familiar in the mouths of Clubman, what was Leonora to do then? She could not control her daughters. She could scarcely guide them. Ethel knew only one law, Fred's wish, and Rose had too much intellect, and Millicent too little heart, to submit to her. Since John's death the house had been the abode of peace and amiability, but it had also been Liberty Hall. If sometimes Leonora regretted that she could not more dominantly impress herself upon her children, she never doubted that on the whole the new republic was preferable to the old tyranny. What, then, had she to do? She had to watch over her girls, and especially over Rose and Minnie. And as she sat in the garden with Bran at her feet, in the solitude which foreshadowed the more poignant solitude to come, she said to herself with passionate maternity, I shall watch over them. If anything occurs, I shall always be ready. And this blissful and transforming thought, this vehement purpose, allayed somewhat the misgivings which she had long had about Millicent, and which her recent glimpses into the factitious and erratic world of the theatre had only served to increase. It was Minnie's affair, which had at length brought Leonora to the point of communicating with Arthur Twemlow. In the first weeks of widowhood, the most terrible of her life, she could not dream of writing to him. Then the sacrifice had dimly shaped itself in her mind, and while actually engaged in fighting against it, she hesitated to send any message whatever. And when she realised that the sacrifice was inevitable for her, when she inwardly knew that Arthur and the splendid rushing life of New York must be renounced in obedience to the double instinct of maternity and of repentance, she could not write. She felt timorous. She was unable to frame the sentences. And she procrastinated, ruled by her characteristic quality of supineness. Once she heard that he had been over to London and gone back, she drew a deep breath as though a peril had been escaped, and procrastinated further. Then came the overtures from Lionel Belmont, or at least from his agents, to Minnie. Belmont was a New Yorker, and the notion suddenly struck her of writing to Arthur for information about Belmont. It was a capricious notion, but it provided an extrinsic excuse for a letter which might be followed by another of more definite import. In the end she was obliged to yield to it. She wrote, as she performed every act of her relationship with Arthur, unwillingly, in spite of her reason, governed by a strange and arbitrary impulse. No sooner was the letter in the pillar-box than she began to wonder what Arthur would say in his response, and how she should answer that response. She grew impatient and restless, and called the chief post-office in Bursley for information about the American mails. On this evening, as Leonora sat in the garden, Minnie was reciting at a concert at Knipe, and Ethel and Fred had accompanied her. Leonora, resisting some pressure, had declined to go with them. Assuming that Arthur wrote on the day he received her missive, his reply, she had ascertained, ought to be delivered to Hillport the next morning, but there was just a chance that it might be delivered that night. Hence she had stayed at home expectant, and, with all her serenity, a little nervous and excited. Carpenter emerged from the region of the stable and began to water some flower-beds in the vicinity of her seat. "'Terrible dry months we've had, ma'am,' he murmured in his quiet pastoral voice, waving the can to and fro. She agreed perfunctorily. Her mind was divided between suspense concerning the postman, contemplation of the placid vista of the remainder of her career, 
and pleasure in the languorous charm of the May evening. Bran moved his head, and rising ponderously walked round the seat towards the house. Then Carpenter, following the dog with his eyes, smiled and touched his cap. Leonora turned sharply. Arthur Tremlow himself stood on the step of the drawing-room window, and Bessie's white apron was just disappearing within. In the first glance, Leonora noticed that Arthur was considerably thinner. She was overcome by a violent emotion that contained both fear and joy, and as he approached her, agitated and unsmiling, the joy said, "'How heavenly it is to see him again!' But the fear asked, "'Why is he so worn? What have we been doing to him all these months, Leonora?' She met him in the middle of the lawn, and they shook hands timidly, clumsily, embarrassed. Carpenter, with that inborn delicacy of tact which is the mark of a simple soul, walked away out of sight, and Bran, receiving no attention, followed him. "'Were you surprised to see me?' Arthur lamely questioned. The hearts a thousand sensations struggled, some for expression, others for concealment, and speech, pathetically unequal to the swift crisis, was disconcerted by it almost to the verge of impotence. Yes, she said, very. You ought not to have been, he replied. His tone alarmed her. Why, she said, when did you get my letter? Just after one o'clock today. Today? I was in London. It was sent on to me from New York. She was relieved. When she saw him first at the window, she had a lightning vision of him tearing open her letter in New York, jumping instantly into a cab, and boarding the English steamer. This had frightened her. It was, if not exactly reassuring, at any rate less terrifying, to learn that he had flown to her only from London. "'Well,' he exclaimed, "'how's everybody, and where are the girls?' She gave the news, and then they walked together to the seat and sat down, in silence. "'You don't look too well,' she ventured. "'You've been working too hard.' Tanned across his forehead, and moved on the seat so as to meet her eyes directly. "'Quite the reverse,' he said. "'I haven't been working hard enough.' "'Not half hard enough,' she repeated mechanically. As his eyes caught hers and held them, she was conscious of an exquisite but mortal tremor. Her spine seemed to give way. The old desire for youth and love, for that brilliant and tender existence in which were united virtue and the flavour of sin, dalliance and high endeavour, eternal appetite and eternal satisfaction, rushed wondrously over her. The life which she had mapped out for herself suddenly appeared miserable, inadequate, even contemptible. Was she, with her rich blood, her perfect health, her proud carriage, her indestructible beauty, and her passionate soul, to wither solitary in the cold shadow? She felt intensely, as every human heart feels sometimes, that the satisfactions of duty were chimerical, and that the only authentic bliss was to be found in a wild and utter abandonment to instinct. No matter what the cost of rapture, in self-respect or in remorse, it was worth the cost. Why did not mankind rise up and put an end to this endless crucifixion of instinct which saddened the whole earth and say gloriously, Let us live? And in a moment, dalliance without endeavour and the flavour of sin without virtue were beautiful ideas for her. She could have put her arms round Arthur's neck and drawn him to her, and blotted out all the past and sullied all the future with one kiss. She wondered what recondite force dissuaded her from doing so. I have but to lift my arms and smile, she thought. You've been very cruel, said Arthur. I wouldn't have believed you could have been so cruel. I, I guess you didn't know how cruel you were. Why didn't you write before? I couldn't, she answered submissively. Didn't you understand? The question was not quite ingenuous, but she meant it well. And so at first, he said, I knew you would want to wait. I knew how upset you'd be. I, I think I knew all you'd feel. But it will soon be eighteen months ago. His voice was full of emotion. Then he smiled gravely and charmingly. However, it's finished now, and I'm here. His indictment was very kind, very mild, but you could see how he had suffered 
and that his wrath against her had been none the less genuine because it was the wrath of love. She grew more and more humble before his gaze, so adoring and so reproachful. She knew that she had been selfish, and that she had ransomed her conscience as much at his expense as at her own. She perceived the vital inferiority of women to men, that quality of callousness which allows them to commit all cruelties in the name of self-sacrifice, and that lack of imagination by which they are blinded to the wounds they deal. Women have brief moods in which they judge themselves as men judge them, in which they escape from their sex and know the truth. Such a mood came then to Leonora, and she wished ardently to compensate Arthur for the martyrdom which she had inflicted on him. They were close to one another. The atmosphere between them was electric, and the darkness of a calm and delicious night was falling. Could she not obey her instinct, and in one bright word, one word laden with the invitation, acquiescence of femininity, atone for her sin against him? Could she not shatter the images of Rose and Milly, who loved her after their hard fashion, but who would never thank her for her watchful affection, would even resent it? Vain hope! Oh! she exclaimed grievously, trying uselessly to keep the dream of joyous indulgence from fading away. I must tell you, I cannot leave them. Leave whom? The girls, Rose and Milly. I daren't. You don't know what I went through after John's death, and I can't desert them. I should have told you in my next letter. Her tones moved not only him, but herself. He was obliged at once to receive what she said with the utmost seriousness, as something fully weighed and considered. Do you mean, he demanded, that you won't marry me and come to New York? I can't. I can't, she replied. He got up and walked along the garden towards the meadow, so far that in the twilight her eyes could scarcely distinguish his figure against the bushes. Then he returned. Just let me hear all about the girls. He stood in front of her. You see, she said entreatingly when she had hurried through her recital, I couldn't leave them, could I? But instead of answering, he questioned her further about Milly's projects, and made suggestions, and they seemed to have been discussing the complex subject for an hour before she found a chance to reassert plaintively, "'I couldn't leave them.' "'You're entirely wrong,' he said firmly and authoritatively. "'You've just got an idea fixed in your head, and it's all wrong, all wrong.' "'It isn't as if they were going to be married,' she obstinately pursued the sequence of her argument. "'Ethel now?' "'Married!' he cried, roused. "'Are we to wait patiently, you and I, until Rose and Milly choose to get married?' He was bitterly scornful. "'Is that our role? I fancy I know something about Rose and Milly. And allow me to tell you they never will get married, neither of them. They aren't the marrying sort. Not but what that's beside the point.' "'Yes,' he continued. "'And if there ever were two girls in this world able to look after themselves without parental assistance, Rose and Milly are those two. "'You don't understand, women. You don't know. You, you don't understand,' she murmured. She was shocked and hurt by this candid and hostile expression of opinion concerning Rose and Milly, whom hitherto he had always appeared to like. "'No,' he retorted with solemn resentment, "'and no man either. Before, when they needed your protection, perhaps, when your husband was alive, you, you would have left Rose and Milly then, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you?' "'Oh!' The exclamation escaped her unawares. She burst into a sob. She had not meant to cry, but she was crying. He sat down close to her and put his hand on her shoulder and leaned over her. "'My dearest girl,' he whispered in a new voice of infinite softness, "'you've forgotten that you have a duty to yourself and to me, as well as to Rose and Milly. Our lives want looking after, too. We're human creatures, you know, you and I.' This row that we're having now has occurred thousands of times before, but this time it's going to be settled with common sense, isn't it? And he kissed her, with a kiss as soft as his voice. She sighed. Still perplexed and unconvinced, she was nevertheless in these minutes acutely happy. The mysterious and profound affinity of the flesh had made a truce between the warring principles of the male and of the female. A truce only. To the left of the house, over the marsh, 
the last silver relics of day hung in the distant sky. She looked at the dying light, so provocative of melancholy in its reluctance to depart, and at the timidly appearing stars and the sombre trees, and her thought was, World, how beautiful and sad you are! Bran emerged forlorn from the gloom, and rested his great chin confidingly on her knees. Bran, she condoled with him through her tears, stroking the dog's head tenderly. Ah, Bran! Arthur stood up, resolute, victorious, but prudent and magnanimous too. He put one foot on the seat beside her, and leaned forward on the raised knee, tapping his stick. "'I've had a flat over there,' he said low in her ear, "'such as can't be gotten outside of New York. And in my thoughts I've made a space for you in New York, where it's life, and no mistake, and where I'm known, and where my interests are. If you don't come, I don't know what I should do. I tell you fair, I don't know what I should do. And wouldn't your life be spoilt, wouldn't it? But it isn't the flat I've got, and it isn't the space I've sort of cleared, and it isn't the ruin and smash for you and me. It's, it isn't so much these things that make me feel wicked, when I think of the mere possibility of you refusing to come, as the fundamental injustice of the thing to both of us. My dear girl, no one ever understood you as I do. I can see it all as well as if I've been here all the time. You took fright after after his death. Women are always more frightened after the danger's over than at the time, especially when they're brave. And you thought, I must do something very good because it was on the cards I might have been very wicked. And so it's Rose and Millie that mustn't be left. <laughs> I'm not much of an intellect outside Crocs, you know, but there's one thing I can do. I can see clear. Can't I see clear? Their hands met in the dog's fur. She was still crying, but she smiled up at him admiringly and appreciatively. "'If Rose and Millie want to change any time,' he continued, "'let them come over, and we could come to Europe just as often as you feel that way, eh?' "'Why,' she meditated, "'cannot this last for ever?' She felt so feminine and illogical, and the masculine, masterful rationality of his appeal had touched her so intimately that she had discovered in the woe and the indecision of her situation a kind of happiness and she wished to keep what she had got. At length a certain courage and resolution visited her, and, summoning all her sweetness, she said to him, "'Don't press me, please, please. In a fortnight I shall be in London with Milly. W will you wait a fortnight? Will you wait that long? I know that what you say is, you will wait that long, won't you? You'll be in London then to meet us?' "'God!' he exclaimed, deeply moved by the fainting, beseeching poignancy of her voice. I'll wait forty fortnights, and I guess I shall be in London. She sank back on the reprieve as on a pillow. Of course I'll wait, he repeated lightly, and his tone said, I understand. Life isn't all logic, and allowances must be made. Women are women. That's what makes them so adorable. And I'm not in a hurry. They did not speak further. A moving patch of white on the path indicated Bessie. "'If you please, ma'am, shall I set supper for five? she asked vivaciously in the summer darkness. There was a silence. "'I'm not staying, Bessie,' said Twemlow. "'Thank you, sir. Come along, Bran. Come, Kennel.' The great beast slouched off and left them together. "'Guess who've been?' Leonora demanded of her girls and Fred, with feverish gaiety, when they returned from the concert. The dining-room was very cheerful and brightly lit. Outside lay the dark garden, and Bran reflective in his kennel. No one could guess Arthur, and so Leonora had t to tell. They were surprised, and they were interested, but not for long. Millicent was preoccupied with her successful performance at the concert, and Ethel and Fred had had a brilliant idea. This couple were to commence married life modestly in Uncle Meshack's house, but the place had been repaired and redecorated and there seemed to be an annoying probability that it would not be finished for immediate occupation after the short honeymoon. Fred could only spare two weekends from the works. Why should they not return on the very day when Leonora and Millie were to go to London and keep house at Hillport during Leonora's absence? Such was the brilliant idea, one of those domestic ideas whose manifold excellences call for interminable explanation and discussion. The name of Arthur Twemlow was not again mentioned. 
End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of Leonora by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter Twelve in London. The last day of the dramatic portion of Leonora's life was that on which she went to London with Minnie. They were up early in order to catch the morning express, and before leaving, Leonora arranged with the excited Bessie all details for the reception of Ethel and Fred who were to arrive in the afternoon from their honeymoon. "'I will drive,' she said to Carpenter when the cart was brought round, and Carpenter had to, to sit behind among the trunks. Bessie, in her morning print and her engagement ring, stood at the front door and sped them beneficently away while clinging hard to Bram. As the train rushed smoothly across the vast and rich plain of Middle England, Leonora's thoughts dwelt on the house at Hillport, on her skilled and sympathetic servants on Prince and Bran, and on the calm and the orderliness and the high decency of everything. And she pictured the homecoming of Ethel and Fred from Wales, Fred stiff and nervous, and Ethel flushed, beautiful, and utterly bewitching in the self-consciousness of the bride. "'May I call her Mrs. Fred, ma'am?' Bessie had asked, recording from the formality of Mrs. Riley, and aware that Miss Ethel was no longer possible. Leonora saw them in the dining-room, consuming the tea which Bessie had determined should be the final word of teas. And she saw Bessie, in that perfect black of hers and that miraculous muslin, waiting at the table with the superlative and cold primness that covered a desire to take Ethel in her arms and kiss her. And she saw the pair afterwards, dallying on the lawn with Bran at dusk, simple, unambitious, unassuming, content. And still later, Fred meticulously locking up the great house, so much too large and complicated for one timid couple, and Ethel standing at the top of the stairs as he extinguished the hall gas. These visions of them made her feel sad, sad because Ethel could never again be that which she had been, and because she was so young, inexperienced, confiding, and beautiful, and would gradually grow old and lose the ineffable grace of her years and situation and because they were both so innocent of the meaning of life. Leonora yearned for some magic to stay the destructive hand of time and keep them ever thus, young, naive, trustful, and unspoilt. And knowing that this could not be, she wanted intensely to shield and teach and advise them. She whispered, thinking of Ethel, Ah, oh, I must always be near, within reach, within call, lest she should need me. Mother! "'Shall you go with me to see Mr. Louis Lewis to-morrow?' Minnie demanded suddenly, when the train halted at Rugby. "'Yes, of course, dear. Don't you wish me to?' "'Oh, I don't mind,' said Minnie grandly. Two well-dressed, middle-aged men entered the compartment, which till then Leonora and Millie had had to themselves. And, while duly admiring Leonora, they could not refrain from looking continually at Millicent. They talked to one another gravely, and they made a pretense of reading newspapers, but their eyes always returned furtively to Milly's corner. The girl was not by any means confused by the involuntary homage, which merely heightened her restless vitality. She chattered to her mother, she was pert, she looked out of the window, she tapped the floor with her brown shoes. In the unconscious process of displaying her individuality for admiration, she was never still. Her fair, pretty face under the straw hat responded to each appreciative glance, and beneath her fine blue coat and skirt the muscles of the immature body and limbs played perpetually in graceful and free movement. She was adorable. She knew it. Leonora knew it. The two middle-aged men knew it. Nothing, no pertness, no audacity, no silliness, no affectation, could impair the extraordinary charm. Leonora was exceedingly proud of her daughter, and yet she reflected impartially that Millicent was a little fool. She trembled for Millicent. She feared to let her out of sight. The idea of Millicent loose in the world, with no guide but her own rashness, and no protection but her vanity, made Leonora feel sick. Nevertheless, Millicent would, would soon be loose in the world, and at the best Leonora could only stand in the background, ready for emergency. At Euston, 
they were not surprised to see Harry. The young man was more dandiacal and correct than ever, and he could cut a figure on the platform. But Leonor observed the pallor of his thin cheeks and the watery redness of his eyes. He had come to meet them, and he insisted on escorting them to their hotel in South Kensington. "'Look here,' he said in the cab, "'I have one dying request to make before the luggage drops through the roof. I want you to both come and dine with me at the Majestic to-night, and then we'll go to the Regency. Lewis has given me a box. By the way, I told him he might rely on me to take you up to see him to-morrow.' "'Shall we, mother?' Minnie asked carelessly but it was obvious that she wished to dine at the Majestic. "'I don't know,' said Leonora. "'There's Rose. We're going to fetch Rose from the hospital this afternoon, Harry, and she will spend the evening with us.' "'Well, Rose must come too, of course,' Harry replied quickly, after a slight hesitation. "'It will do her good.' "'We will see,' said Leonora. She had known Harry from his infancy, and when she encountered him in these latter days she was always subject to the illusion that he could not really be a man but was rather playing at manhood. Moreover, she had warned Arthur Tremlow of their arrival, and expected to find a letter from him at the hotel, and she could make no arrangements until she had seen the letter. They drove into the courtyard of the select and austere establishment where John Stanway had brought his wife on her wedding journey. Leonora found that it had scarcely changed. The dark entrance lounge presented the same appearance now as it had done more than twenty years ago. It had the same air of receiving visitors with condescension. The whole street was the same. She grew thoughtful, and Harry's witticisms, as he ceremoniously superintended their induction into the place, served only to deepen the shadow in her heart. "'Any letters for me?' she asked the hall-porter, loitering behind while Liminicent and Harry went into the salle a manger. "'It won't name, madam? Uh, no, madam.' But during luncheon, to which Harry stayed, a flunky approached, bearing a telegram on silver. "'In a moment, I thought, I shall know when we are to meet.' And she trembled with apprehension. The flunky, however, gave the telegram to Millicent, who accepted it as though she had been accepting telegrams at the hands of flunkies all her life. "'Miss Stanway,' she smiled superiorly, with her chin forward, perceiving the look on Leonora's face. She tore the envelope. "'Louis says I am to go to-day at four instead of to-morrow. Hooray! The sooner it's over, the sooner to sleep, though the harbour bar be moaning. Ma, that's the very time you have to meet Rose at the hospital. Harry, you should take me. Leonora would have preferred that Harry and Millicent should not go alone together to see Mr. Louis Lewis, but she could not bring herself to break the appointment with Rose, who was extremely sensitive. Nor could she well inform Harry, at this stage of his close intimacy with the family, that she no longer cared to entrust Milly to his charge. She left the hotel before the other two, because she had further to drive. The hansom had scarcely got into the street when she instructed the driver to return. "'Of course you will settle nothing definitely with Mr. Lewis,' she said to Minnie. "'Tell him I wish to see him first. "'Oh, mother!' the girl cried, pouting. At the new female and maternity hospital in Land's Conduit Street, Leonora was shown to a bench in the central hall and requested to sit down. The clock over the first landing of the double staircase indicated three minutes to four. During the drive she had begun by expecting to meet Arthur on his way to the hotel, and even in Piccadilly, where delays of traffic had forced upon her attention the glittering opulence and afternoon splendour of the London season, she had still thought of him and of the interview which was to pass between them. But here she was obsessed by her immediate environment. The approach to the hospital through sombre, squalid streets, past narrow courts in which innumerable children tumbled and yelled, disturbed and desolated her. It appeared that she had entered the secret breeding quarter of the immense city, the obscene district where misery teemed and generated, and where the revolting fecundity of nature was proved amid surroundings of horror and despair. And the hospital itself was the very centre, the innermost temple of all this ceaseless parturition. In a corner of the hall, near a door, waited a small crowd of embossed women, young and middle-aged, sad, weary, unkempt, lightly dressed in shabby, shapeless clothes, and sweltering in the summer heat. A few had babes in their arms. In the doorway two neatly attired youngish women, either doctors or students, held an animated and interminable conversation, 
staring absent-mindedly at the attendant crowd. A pale nurse came hurrying from the back of the hall and vanished through the doorway, squeezing herself between the doctors or students, who soon afterwards followed her, still talking. And then, one by one, the embossed women began to vanish through the doorway also. The clock gently struck four, and Leonora, sighing, watched the hand creep to five minutes and to ten beyond the hour. She gazed up the whirl of the staircases, and in imagination saw ward after ward, floor above floor of beds, on which lay repulsive and piteous creatures in fear, in pain, in exhaustion. And she thought with dismay how many more poor immortal souls went out of that building than ever went into it. Rose is somewhere up there, she reflected. At a quarter past four a stout white-haired lady briskly descended the stairs, and, after being accosted twice by officials, spoke to Leonora. "'You are Mrs. Stanway. My name is Smithson. I dare say your daughter has mentioned it in her letters.' The famous dean of the hospital smiled, and paused while Leonora responded. "'Just at the moment,' Miss Smithson continued, "'dear Rosalie's is engaged, but I hope she will be down directly. We are very, very busy. Are you making a long stay in London, Mrs. Stanway? The season is now in full swing, is it not?' Leonora could find little to say to this experienced spinster, whom she unwillingly admired, but with whom she was not in accord. Miss Smithson uttered amiable banalities with an evident intention to do nothing more. Her demeanour was preoccupied, and she made no further reference to Rose. Soon a nurse respectfully called her. She hastened away, full of apologies, leaving Leonora to meditate upon her own shortcomings as a serious person and upon the futility of her existence of forty-one years. Another quarter of an hour elapsed, and then Rose ran impetuously down the stone steps. "'Mother, I'm so glad to see you. Where's Milly?' she exclaimed eagerly, and they kissed twice. As she answered the greeting, Leonora noticed the lines of fatigue in Rose's face, the brilliancy of her eyes, the emaciation of the body beneath her grey alpaca dress, and that air of false serenity masking hysteric excitement which she seemed to have noticed too in all the other officials, the doctors or students, the nurses, and, and even the dean. "'Are you ready now, dear?' she asked. "'Oh, I can't possibly come to-day, mother. Didn't Miss Smithson tell you? I'm awfully sorry. I can't. But there's a very important case on. I can only stay a minute.' "'But, my child, we've arranged to take you to the theatre. Leonora was on the point of expostulating. She checked herself, and placidly replied, "'I'm sorry, too. When shall you be free?' might be able to get off to-morrow. I'll slip out in the morning and send you a telegram. I should like you to try and be free to-morrow, my dear. You seem as if you needed a rest. Do you take any exercise? Oh, as much as I can. But you know, Rose. That's all right, Mater, Rose interrupted confidently, patting her mother's arm. We can look after ourselves here, don't you worry. Have you seen Mr. Tremlay yet? Not yet. Why? Oh, nothing. But he called it to see me yesterday. We're great friends. I must run back now. Leonora departed with the girl's hasty kiss on her lips, realising that she had fallen to the level of a mere episodic interest in Rosie's life. The impassioned student of obstetrics had disappeared up the staircase before Leonora could reach the double doors of the entrance. The mother was dashed, stricken, a little humiliated. But as she arranged the folds of her beautiful dress in the hansom which was carrying her away from Land's Conduit Street towards South Kensington, she said to herself firmly, I am not a ninny, after all, and I know that Rose will be ill soon, and there are things in that hospital that I could manage better. Uh, "'Mr. Tremlow came to see you just after you left,' said Harry, when he restored Millie to her mother at half-past five. "'I asked him to join us at dinner, but he said he couldn't. However, he's coming to the theatre, to our box.' "'You must excuse us from dining with you to-night, Harry,' was Leonora's reply. "'We'll meet you at the theatre.' "'Yes, Harry,' said Millicent coldly. We really can't come to-day. "'The hand of the Lord is heavy upon me,' Harry murmured, and he repeated the phrase on leaving the hotel. Neither he nor Millicent had shown much interest in Rose's defection. The dandy seemed to be relieved, and Millicent said, "'How stupid of her!' Millie had returned from the visit to Mr. Louis Lewis in a state of high self-satisfaction. Leonora was told that Mr. Lewis was simply the most delightful and polite man that Milly had ever met. He would be charmed to see Mrs. Stanway, and would make an appointment. Meanwhile, 
Millie gave her mother to understand that the affair was practically settled. She knew the date when the tour of Princess Puck started, and the various towns which it would include, and Mr. Lewis had provided her with a box for the next afternoon at the Queen's Theatre, where the piece had been most successfully produced a month ago. The music she would receive by post, and the first reprisal of the number one company would occur within a week or so. Millicent walked in flowery paths. She saw herself covered with jewels and compliments, flattered, adored, worshipped, and leading always a life of superb luxury. And this prophetic dream was not the conception of a credulous fancy, but the product of the hard and calculating shrewdness which she possessed. She was aware of the importance of Mr. Louis Lewis, who, on behalf of Lionel Belmont, absolutely controlled three West End theatres, and she was also aware of the effect which she had had upon him. She knew that in her personality there was a mysterious something which intoxicated not all the men with whom she came into contact, but most of them, and men of utterly different sorts. She did not trouble to attempt any analysis of that quality. She accepted it as a natural phenomenon, and she meant to use it ruthlessly, for she was almost incapable of pity or gratitude. It was, for instance, her intention to drop Harry. She had no further use for him now. She was learning to forget her childish awe of Leonora. A very little time, and she would implacably force her mother to recognise that even the semblance of parental control must cease. "'And I would have to my photograph taken, Mamma," she exclaimed triumphantly. "'Mr. Lewis says that Antonio's in Regent Street will be only too glad to take it for nothing. He's going to send them a line.' Leonora was silent. Deep in her heart she made a gesture of appeal to each of her daughters, to Ethel, who was immersed in love, to Rose, who was absorbed by a vocation, and to this seductive minx whose venal lips would only smile to gain an end. And each seemed to throw her a glance indifferent or preoccupied, and to say, Presently, presently, when I can spare a moment. And she thought bitterly how Rose had been content to receive her mother in the public hall of the hospital. They were late in arriving at the theatre because the cab could not get through Piccadilly, and Harry was impatiently expecting them in the foyer. His brow smoothed at once when he caught sight of them, and he barred their dresses and escorted them up the celebrated marble stairs with youthful pride. "'I thought no one was going to supervene,' he smiled. "'I was afraid you'll be murdered in patent asphyxiating Hampsons. I don't know what happened to Twemlow. I must leave word with the people here which box he's to come to.' "'Perhaps he won't come.' thought Leonora. Perhaps I shall not see him till to-morrow. Harry's box was exactly in the middle of the semicircle of boxes which surround the balcony of the Regency Theatre. They were ushered into it with the precautions of silence, for the 355th performance of The Domenico Doll, the unique musical comedy from New York, had already commenced. Leonora and Millie sat in front, and Harry drew up a chair so that he might whisper in their ears. He was very talkative. Leonora could see nothing clearly at first. Then gradually the crowded auditorium arranged itself in her mind. She perceived the semicircle of boxes, each exactly like their own, and each filled with women quite as elegantly gowned as she and Millicent, and men as dandiacal and correct as Harry. And in the balcony and in the stalls were serried regular rows of elaborate coiffures and shining bald heads. And all the seats seemed to be pervaded by the glitter of gems, the wing-like beating of fans, and the restless curving of arms. She had not visited London for many years, and this multitudinous and wholesale opulence startled her. Under other circumstances she would have enjoyed it intensely, and basked in it as a flower in the sunshine. Tonight, however, she could not dismiss the image of Rose and the gaunt hospital in Lamb's Conduit Street. She knew the comparison was crude. She assured herself that there must always be rich and poor, idle and industrious, gay and sorrowful, elegant and shabby, arrogant and meek. But her discomfort none the less persisted, and she had the uneasy feeling that the whole of civilization was wrong, and that Rose and the earnest ones were justified in their scorn of such as her. And concurrently she dwelt upon Ethel and Fred at that hour, and listened with anxiety for the opening of the box door and the entry of Arthur Twemlow. She imagined that, owing to their late arrival, 
she must have missed the one essential clue to the plot of the Dominical doll, and as the gorgeously decorated action was developed on the dazzling stage, she tried in vain to grasp its significance. The fall of the curtain came as a surprise to her. The end of the first act had left her with nothing but a confused notion of the interior of a confectioner's shop, and young men therein getting tipsy and stealing kisses, and marvellously pretty girls submitting to the robbery with the nonchalance born of three hundred and fifty-four similar experiences, and old men grotesque in a dissolute senility, and sudden bursts of orchestral music, and simpering ballads, and comic refrains, and crashing choruses, and lights, lingerie, picture-hats, and short skirts, and over all, dominating all, the set, eternal, mechanical, bored smile of the pretty girls. "'Awfully good, isn't it?' said Harry, when the generous applause had ceased. "'It's simply lovely,' Milly agreed, fidgeting on her chair in juvenile rapture. "'Yes,' Leonora admitted. And she indeed thought that parts of it were amusing and agreeable. "'Of course,' Harry remarked hastily to Leonora, "'Princess Puck isn't at all like this. It's an idle sort of thing, you know. By the way, hadn't I better go out and offer a reward for the recovery of Twemlow?' He returned just as the curtain went up, bringing a faint odour of whisky, but without Twemlow. A few moments later, while the principal pretty girl was warbling invitation to her lover amid the diversions of Narragansett Pier, the latch of the door clicked, and Arthur noiselessly entered the box. He nodded cheerfully, murmuring, "'Sorry I'm so late,' and then shook hands with Leonora. She could not find her voice. In the hazard of rearranging the seats, an operation which Harry from diffidence conducted with a certain clumsiness, Arthur was placed behind Milly, while Leonora had Harry by her side. "'You've missed all the first act, and everyone says it's the best,' Milly remarked, leaning towards Arthur with an air of intimacy, and Harry expressed agreement. "'But you must remember I saw it in New York two years ago,' Leonora heard him whisper in reply. She liked his avuncular, slightly quizzical attitude to them. He reinforced the elder generation in the box, reducing by his mere presence the two young and callow creatures to their proper position in the scheme of things. And now the question of her future relations with Arthur, which hitherto she had in a manner shunned, at once became peremptory for Leonora. She was conscious of a passionate tenderness for him, he seemed to her to have qualities indefinable and exquisite touches of character which she had never observed in any other human being. But she was in control of her heart. She had chosen, and she knew that she could abide by her choice. She was uplifted by the force of one of those tremendous and invincible resolutions which women alone, with their instinctive bent towards martyrdom, are capable of making. And the resolution was not the fruit of the day, the result of all that she had recently seen and thought. It was a resolution independent of particular circumstances, a simple admission of the naked fact that she could not desert her daughters. If Ethel had been shrewd and worldly, and Rose temperate in her altruism, and Milly modest and sage, the resolution would not have been modified. She dared not abandon her daughters. The blood in her veins, the stern traits inherited from her irreproachable ancestors, forbade it. She might be convinced in argument, and she vividly remembered everything that Arthur had said. She might admit that she was wrong, that her sacrifice would be futile, and that she was about to be guilty of a terrible injustice to Arthur and to herself. No matter. She would not leave the girls. And if, in thus obstinately remaining at their service, she committed a sin, she could only ask pardon for that sin. She could only beg Arthur to forgive her, and assure him that he would forget, and submit to his reproaches in silence and humility. Now and then she gazed at him, but his eyes were always fixed on the stage, and the corners of his mouth turned down into a slightly ironic smile. She wondered if he expected to be able to persuade her, and whether an opportunity to convince him and so end the crisis would occur that evening or whether she would be compelled to wait through another night. At last the adventures of the Domenico doll were concluded, the naughty kisses regularized, the old men finally befooled, the glory extinguished, the music hushed. 
the audience stood up and began to chatter, and the women curved their long arms backward to receive white cloaks from the men. Arthur led the way out with Milly, and as the party slowly proceeded through the crush into the foyer, Leonora could hear the impetuous and excited child delivering to him her professional views on the acting and the singing. "'Well, Burgess,' Arthur said in the portico, "'I guess we'll see these ladies home, eh?' And he called to a commissioner, "'Say, are two handsomes?' In a minute Leonora and Arthur were driving together along the scintillating nocturnal thoroughfare. He had put Harry and Millicent into the other handsome like schoolchildren. And in the sudden privacy of the vehicle Leonora thought, Now. She looked up at him furtively from beneath her eyelashes. He caught the glance and shook his head sadly. Why do you shake your head? he timidly began. His kind, shrewd eyes caressed her. You mustn't look at me so, he said. Why? I can't stand it, he replied. It's too much for me. You don't know. You don't know. You think I'm calm enough. But I tell you, the top of my head has nearly come off today. But I— Listen here, he ran on. Let me finish up. What I said a fortnight ago was quite right. It was absolutely unanswerable. But there was something about your letter that upset me. I can't tell you what it was, only it made my heart beat. And when yesterday I happened to go and worry out Rose of that awful hospital— and then Millie tonight. I know how you feel. I've got it to the eighth of an inch. And I thought, suppose I do get her to New York, and she isn't happy. Well, it's right here. I've settled to sell my business over there, and fix up in London. What do I care for New York, anyway? I don't care for anything, so long as we can be happy. I've been a bachelor too long. And if I can be alone with you in this London, lost in it, just you and me— Oh, well, I want a woman to think about, one woman all mine. I'm simply mad for it. We can only live once. We shan't be short of money. Now, don't look at me any more like you did. Say yes, and let's begin right away and be happy. Do you really mean? She was obliged thus, in weak, unfinished phrases, to gain time in order to recover from the shock. I'm going to cable tomorrow morning, he said joyously. Not that there's so much hurry as all that, but I shall feel better after I've cabled. I'm silly, and I want to be silly. I, I wouldn't live in New York for a million now. And don't you think we could keep an eye on Rose and Millicent between us? Oh, Arthur! She breathed a long, deep sigh, shutting her eyes for an instant. And then the beautiful creature, with all her elegance and her appearance of impassive and fastidious calm, permitted herself to move infinitesimally, but perceptibly, closer to him in the handsome, and her spirit performed the supreme feminine act of acquiescence and surrender. She thought passionately, He has yielded to me. I will be his slave. I shall call you Leo, he murmured fondly. It occurred to me last night. She smiled, as if to say, How charmingly boyish you are! And I must tell you, but see here, we shall be at your hotel too soon. He pushed at the trap door. Say, driver, go up Park Lane and along Oxford Street a bit. Then he explained to her how he had refused Harry's invitation to dinner and had arrived late at the theatre solely that he might not have to talk to her until they could talk in solitude. At last the cab rolled swiftly southwards through the mysterious dark avenues of Hyde Park. Leonora had the sensation of being really alone with him in the very heart of that luxurious, voluptuous, and decadent civilization, for which she had always yearned, and in which she was now to participate. The feeling of the beauty of the world, and of his catholicity and many-sidedness, returned to her. She gave play to her instincts, and, revelling in the self-confidence and the masterful assentance which underlay Arthur's usual reticent demeanour, she resumed with exquisite relief her natural supineness. She began to depend on him, and she foresaw how he would reason diplomatically with Rose, and watch between Milly and Mr. Louis Lewis, and perhaps assist Fred Riley, and do in the best way everything that ought to be done, and how she would reward him with the consolations of her grace and charm, her feminine arts, and her sweet acquiescence. "'So you've come!' exclaimed Milly 
rather desolate in the drawing-room of the hotel. "'Yes, Miss Muffet,' said Arthur, "'we've come. Where is the youth?' "'Harry, I made him go home.' Leonora smiled indulgently at Millicent with her pretty pouting face and her adorable artificiality, lounging on one of the sofas in the vast, garish chamber. And her thoughts flew to Ethel, an existence in Bursley. The Myatt family had risen, flourished, and declined. Some of its members were dead, in honour or in dishonour. Others were scattered now. Only Ethel and Fred remained, and these two, in the house at Hillport, which Leonora meant to give them, were beginning again the eternal effort, and renewing the simple and austere traditions of the five towns, where luxury was suspect and decadence unknown. End of chapter 12 End of Leonora by Arnold Bennett